So our first speaker this morning, a really great speaker, I'm really pleased to have a, a fellow mechanical engineer here with us, Gwen Shotwell. Gwen, of course, as you all know, is the president and chief operating officer of SpaceX, the world's fastest growing space transportation company that designs, manufactures, and launches their own rockets and spacecraft. The reusable Dragon cargo capsule was the first private spacecraft to visit the International Space Station, and they've repeated that feat. Um, then, and looking forward to many more here in the upcoming years. Gwen uh, actually joined SpaceX in 2002 as Vice President of Business Development, and she has built the manifest for the Falcon launch vehicle family to nearly 50 launches representing the, the uh, a potential of $5 billion in revenue as those fly out over the next few years. As president, Gwen manages all the day-to-day -day operations, including production, launch, sales, mission management, and finance. She did receive a bachelor's and master's degrees with honors in mechanical engineering and applied mathematics from Northwestern University. Uh, Gwen's speech will be on the space revolution. Please welcome our keynote speaker, Gwen Schott. Happy to be here. I actually haven't been uh, since 2006 when the conference looked uh, quite a bit different. Um, so it's going to come as a shock to you, but Pat asked me to talk about a million things, um, and it was kind of hard for me to focus. Um, but uh, I figured I could probably touch on almost every subject if I did a kind of a past, present, and future uh, summary of SpaceX and, uh, and what we're doing. And really, my, my aim here is to embolden those who are considering entering the space industry as an entrepreneur, or to give kind of some moral support to those of you who are there and potentially struggling. Uh, it's a tough industry. We have uh, seen lots of highs and lots of lows, but uh, I'm happy to say that uh, Right now, it's all pretty much high, which is fabulous. So uh, if you could pull up my, actually, let's just go right to the first video. So this is SpaceX video. You'll never see a SpaceX presentation without a video. I'm a video from the 1980s MTV age. up in a, a human rated dragon is uh, not going to be an issue. Slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. So, um, for those of you that don't know, I'm going to give just a very brief summary of, uh, of SpaceX and what we're about. If you didn't quite pick it up in the 45-second video there, so we were founded in 2002 uh, with a pure focus on enhancing the reliability and dramatically decreasing the cost of space transportation systems. So that was the focus, but the goal ultimately was to do a good job at those two things, increase reliability, decrease costs, such that we could facilitate uh, human exploration in space and ultimate settlement on another planet. We haven't been shy about that. Certainly when we started, we were a little bit quiet about that because it's a little bit crazy. Um, and then once you demonstrate a little bit of technical chops, I think it's okay to talk about hard things and, and look a little bit crazier. 
So we have uh, over 3,000 employees, about 3,800 if you include all the contractors that we have helping us. Um, Four billion in business left between now and 2017 to execute. Uh, over 50 flights on the manifest now. We've done a little bit of BD uh, in the recent months. Um, very successful Falcon 9 program. Uh, we've had uh, six flights to date, uh, three of which took a dragon to the International Space Station, berthed, uh, exchanged cargo, and came back, uh, recovering science on a couple of them, which is really extraordinary. Um, we have launch sites at Cape Canaveral. We just christened our launch site at Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, on the uh, 30th of September. Um, and we have test sites current operating in Texas. Um, you see the Grasshopper vehicle there. I've got another Grasshopper video. Um, and then we're bringing the follow-on to Grasshopper to our New Mexico test site here at Spaceport America. We're very excited about that. We should see some additional really crazy things going on with the new version of Grasshopper starting in December. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the past, and I'll try to weave in some of the themes that, uh, that Pat wanted me to. Um, bottom left photo was the SpaceX factory in 2002, empty, with the exception of Elon's F1, which he has subsequently returned and uh, is now driving green vehicles, which I'm happy to talk about. Um, so we were incorporated in May 2002. I was the seventh employee um, hired to try to bring in business. Um, to this company with the empty factory. Um, and we ended the year with 14 employees. Next slide. So I'm gonna skip a couple years and go to 2006. So we were focused in that time frame purely on the Falcon 1 launch vehicle. It was a great uh, opportunity for us to develop engines, figure out how to develop avionics, uh, build tanks uh, on a pretty small scale. You could almost put your arms around the Falcon 1. Um, and there's no question that we struggled in that development. We were a brand new company, brand new people, some of who were never involved in the space industry before. Um, so we had our first liftoff of Falcon 1 in 2006 from Kwajalein. Uh, we were hoping to launch from Vandenberg, but we had a little bit of struggle convincing folks that it would be safe to let us do that. Um, so we flew from Kwajalein, and uh, we had a, uh, an alumina, a a, aluminum bina corrode uh, pop open upon pressurization in the fuel system. We lit the engine, lifted off, and uh, had a conflagration in the back end of the vehicle. We actually put the, uh, this photo up on uh, our website right afterwards. We try to be as transparent as we possibly can within the bounds of State Department regulations. Um, so we had this fire. It basically ended up cutting the lines, valve shut, and the vehicle came back uh, to, uh, to Earth after only going up about a mile. Um, Struggled a lot, but learned a lot that day. SpaceX became a very different company that day. Um, so that was the hard part of 2006, but the better part of 2006 was when we were granted one of the uh, agreements with NASA under the Commercial Orbital Transportation System uh, program, um, which I think could potentially go down in history as one of the most extraordinary programs demonstrating a public-private partnership so under that agreement, it morphed over time, and in the end, uh, NASA uh, gave SpaceX $396 million. Um, SpaceX subsequently put or put in approximately $450 million of our own uh, money. And, and what came out of that program? Falcon 9 launch vehicle and a Dragon capsule. Falcon 9 launch vehicle finally bringing U.S. competitiveness back to the commercial launch marketplace. In 2011, we won every fairly competed Falcon 9 deal in the vehicle class, um, and we will bring space launch back to the U.S. and those critical jobs, especially in these times. Um, so Falcon 9 launch vehicle and the Dragon capsule, which birthed with the International Space Station um, and uh, really facilitates the science because Dragon is the only capsule that can bring back uh, a substantial amount of science. You can tuck a few things in on the Soyuz return flight, but Dragon's the only one that can bring back kind of the quantity of science necessary to keep the ISS humming and, uh, and valuable. So I, I really want to emphasize um, NASA's role in this program. It was extraordinary. It was a new kind of program for them. For this kind of money, I mean, how do you, you know, for $850 million, how do you get a launch vehicle and a capsule that bursts with the International Space Station plus two demonstration flights? Um, 
they, they behaved in a different way, and, and ultimately we grew up with really good habits under their guidance. So great program. All right, now skip ahead to 2008. We move, we, we, even though we have not gotten to orbit yet, by the way. Falcon 1 had a, so we had the Flight 1 in 2006, Flight 2 in 2007. This is early 2008, and we signed this giant lease on this giant facility, uh, which is ultimately our headquarters now and primary factory uh, for the Falcon 9 rockets and the Dragon capsules. But we felt comfortable enough with our business plan, even though we had yet to get to orbit in four years, uh, to invest in this gigantic cavernous building at the time. And by the way, now we're like scrunched for space. I never thought we'd fill it. Um, 2008 was a great year, an extraordinary year. We, we got uh, Falcon 1 to orbit seven weeks after Flight 3, which was another failure. Um, so in uh, September of 2008, got Falcon 1 to orbit. It was an extraordinary boost for the company. Uh, and then about three months later, NASA awarded SpaceX the cargo resupply contract to th in the end of 2008, which was a $1.6 billion uh, contract. This was actually in a contract. It wasn't an agreement like COTS, a full FAR contract um, to do 12 missions to the International Space Station. A leap of faith for NASA, but, uh, but I think they're glad that they did. Next. Oh, we ended the year 2008 with 618 employees. I think it's important to talk about the growth for those of you that are going to come do the same thing. You have to be prepared because uh, massive growth is frightening and uh, you learn how to break departments by hiring that many people in one year. Okay, next slide. 2010, another extraordinary year. Uh, we rolled out the Falcon 9 launch vehicle, successfully flied it twice. Uh, in June and then subsequently in December. Uh, and then the December flight took Dragon to orbit and we returned Dragon capsule. So another really great kind of moving forward for the commercial fl space flight industry. Um, I think we were the only ones at that time to have orbited uh, a satellite or a capsule and, and having had it survive reentry. We have this uh, Dragon, by the way, hanging in our factory. So if you come see a tour, you look up and there's this giant dragon hanging from the ceiling in LA and earthquakes. People don't usually stand underneath it. Um, in addition, on the business side, we signed the largest commercial contract ever for, uh, for launch with Iridium, about a $500 million commercial contract to fly uh, the Iridium satellite, the Iridium next generation of satellites to orbit. So it was really a great year. Uh, we ended the year with 1,200 employees. So now we're going to skip 2011. That was a hard year. We were a launch company and we didn't fly. Uh, the reason was because we were taking Dragon from that initial version that could orbit and re-enter to a Dragon that could actually berth with the International Space Station and pass all those safety reviews and all those, um, basically all the checks that NASA needs to do uh, to ensure safety of the astronauts on the ISS. Um, but in 2012, great year. Uh, we got uh, to the International Space Station twice. Um, we were well along the way to completing a pretty substantial upgrade to the Falcon 9 launch vehicle at that time, too. We called it the version 1.1 to not scare anybody, but really it's like the version 1001. Uh, it was quite a different vehicle. Um, and uh, we ended 2012 with 2,200 employees. And then 2013, yay. Um, next slide. Thank you. So uh, just a few weeks ago, we flew this upgraded Falcon 9. Uh, this was really the demonstration flight to prove to our commercial customers that we can fly a giant fairing the size of a living room, a three-story living room, um, and successfully deploy satellites, not just Dragon, uh, to its intended orbit. Um, I have a video of this flight. Um, this, keep in mind, this is basically a brand new launch vehicle on a brand new launch site. And uh, I can't tell you how proud I am of my team who can pull this together. It's a small team. I mean, 3,000 employees seems gigantic, but it's a really small team to be doing this kind of work. So if we could roll this video, please. T-minus 15. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Four, three, two, one, zero. Lift off. 
prop AVI GNC, move to section 10.59. GC, move to section 10.58. GC's in 10.58. First stage propellant utilization active. Good telemetry, good power health. The vehicle is passing through maximum aerodynamic pressure. Telemetry still nominal, power still nominal. Second stage engine chill has started. Stage one shutdown. Stage sub confirmed. And that ignition confirmed. Stage two propulsion looking good. Fairing separation confirmed. First stage is relighting at this time. This is the first stage during reentry. We relit the engines to slow it down. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Extraordinary. I don't think it's ever been done. Supersonic retro propulsion. So it was a great flight. Lots of controversy about that flight. I'm hoping to get some questions on it. Uh, next slide. So past, I gave you a little bit of information about the history, um, hopefully give you some idea of the genetics of SpaceX and give you confidence that, uh, that you can prevail through some pretty tough times. Um, we're now into what we consider to be our regular operations. Uh, we've got a flight uh, for SES. Uh, coming up here in uh, about 26 days out of the Cape, followed up shortly thereafter by TICOM. We'll take a mini hiatus for a couple of months and then start flying uh, CRS-2 and then the remainder of our commercial flights next year and do some ad additional government missions and actually four CRS flights we hope to do next year. So what's ahead? Um, we've not been shy about, next slide, uh, the fact that we want Dragon to carry people as well as cargo and science. Um, we're very excited about this program. We're Kind of, kind of at near the tail end of what we call this, or what NASA calls the CCI CAP program, where we're taking that Dragon capsule, um, we're looking at it from a system perspective to carry humans, we're going through safety reviews, um, building the escape system, which is the primary thing missing from the current cargo capsule, um, building that escape system, um, and then getting to approximately CDR phase uh, before hopefully we enter into the next phase uh, of this program. Um, We'd love to see uh, the first human flight in about three years. Um, and I can't tell you right now whether that first flight will have NASA or SpaceX astronauts. They're, it's kind of been going both ways. Right now, I think it's tipping towards uh, NASA astronauts, um, which sorely disappoints my 3,000 employees because one of them wants to fly, uh, or one of them expects to fly on a Dragon. 
Um, they actually all want to fly. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that'll be very exciting. We hope to fly people in 2016. Next slide. So crew, now we've got heavy. We have to continue to build the building blocks necessary to demonstrate the capability to continue to build building blocks towards space transportation systems that can take folks to Mars. Falcon Heavy is one step in that direction. Um, it leverages current technology. It's basically, I tell my guys, you know, how can it take so long to do this? It's just three Falcon 9s glued together, fly and go, it's easy. A um, little bit of pushback on that. Um, this vehicle should be capable about 53 metric tons uh, to, uh, 53,000, excuse me, metric tons, 53 metric tons to orbit, which take, gets us close to that $1,000 a pound uh, metric that, that we're all kind of striving for, and hopefully future technologies will get us even further, actually. Next slide. So we got crew, we got Falcon Heavy, and now we have Grasshopper, who, you know, is in the media more than Elon is these days. Grasshopper is an absolute rock star. Um, I actually have another Grasshopper video. This is of the most recent flight, uh, 744 meters. This is out of our Central Texas test facilities. Can we go ahead and roll this video? Extraordinary. We have about 25 people working the Grasshopper program, and there's about 3,000 that actually want to. Um, so I want to give a little bit of explanation on this Grasshopper program. What are we doing here? We're trying to demonstrate, develop and demonstrate the technologies for full and rapid reuse of stages, rocket stages. This is a, one, a version 1.1 Falcon 9 stage. Um, oh, it's okay. Just keep it on this slide. Um, oh, actually, no. you got to go one back. Sorry. I'll tell you what that is in just a sec. Extraordinary. Um, so Grasshopper is, we call a test rig. It's a 1.1 uh, first stage uh, outfitted with one engine and a test set of landing gear. It's permanent and stable. So what we're moving to now is what we call the Falcon 9-er. Falcon 9 are reusable. Um, and that is a full Falcon 9 first stage, nine engines and retractable landing gear. Um, so that is the vehicle that we will be bringing here to New Mexico, which I'll talk about in just a second. But I want to show you here what this photo is and why we were so right, jubilant after the last flight. Not only did we get every one of our customers to their intended orbit, um, but this is a picture of that first stage at about three meters above the ocean, fully intact. It did remain intact after it hit the ocean but it was intact. I don't think anyone's ever done that. So we said, okay, between the flights we've been doing with Grasshopper and this demonstration that we brought that stage back, we're really close to full and rapid reuse of stages. Um, super exciting. And I don't think this photo has been released yet. Um, uh, extraordinary. Um, okay, so next slide is uh, our, our uh, Falcon 9er. Uh, pad being developed uh, here at Spaceport America. Uh, we're very excited about this. This site gives us the flexibility to go as high and as fast as we need to for obvious reasons. In Central Texas, we can't go that high because there's a lot of neighbors. Like right there, they come out 
pull out their lawn chairs and watch grasshopper fly around their neighborhood, um, which we can't do when we're flying at multiples of Mach numbers. So um, very excited about coming here. Hopefully we'll have our first flight uh, in December. Next slide. So where do we go? Uh, we've not been silent about the fact that we want to go to Mars. We think Mars is the right place to go. Um, I've stolen, sort of stolen a couple of slides from Charles Alachi, who did a really inspirational pitch on Mars and why Mars. Um, so if we could move to the next slide. So Mars, su surprisingly, to me at least, I'm not a geologist and I'm, I'm not really a Mars person. Um, Mars shares very similar features to Earth. Uh, there are Grand Canyons. You see Arizona's Grand Canyon on the left um, and Victoria Crater uh, on the right, taken, uh, photo taken by Opportunity. Um, very similar features. Next slide. Volcanoes. Um, in fact, that the volcanic activity on Mars produces the exact same kind of igneous rocks and materials that, uh, that we see here on Earth. Um, Mount St. Helens on the left and uh, Olympus Mons on the right. Of course, the volcanoes on Mars are much, much higher uh, than they are here on Earth, but, but nonetheless, very similar geology. Next slide. Even if you look at the rocks, the material is incredibly similar to what you find here on Earth. Next slide. So you can't tell whether this is a photo of Mars or a desert here in New Mexico or Arizona or California. It happens to be Mars. Um, next slide. At any rate, you know, hopefully we'll get the sense that uh, Mars will feel a little bit more like home than we thought. Any questions? Come on, questions. Yes. We have questions over oh, here. Oh, I'm Let sorry, me, I broke the it's rules. Okay. It's okay. If you've got questions, so write them down in a little slips of paper, and our and our students will be here to pick them up. So I've got a, several questions. Um, first question I'll pose to you is: How will uh, will the previous versions of Falcon 9 still be used? Are there any remaining in your inventory? So after this, we, we had to have the ability to build another original version of Falcon 9. Uh, until the success of 1.1 to fly the Jason 3 mission. Um, but we did fly the Jason, or we did fly the 1.1 successfully, so we have now officially released the 1.0 uh, from, uh, from our inventory. There's still bits and pieces, which we'll be obviously grabbing and storing somewhere. We never throw anything out. We, we spend more money on storage space, I think, than any aerospace company. We never throw any, we still have Falcon 1 parts and ground support equipment. Um, so no, no more 1.0, it's all 1.1. Um, next question is about launch sites. Um, the question here is regarding the Shiloh site, which is in the north side of the Kennedy Space Center. Is SpaceX's schedule for selecting a new launch site consistent with the schedule in Florida for its Shiloh environmental study? You know, I'm actually not familiar with uh, the schedule on Shiloh, just not right at this particular moment. <laughs> we have a Shiloh supporter here. Yes. Um, there's no question we're going to increase our footprint uh, in Florida. Um, we hope to do that in a, a number of different ways. Shiloh may be um, a site selected. It probably won't be in the initial round. Um, there's still a lot of work to do, I think, to get folks comfortable with that. Um, we're, so we're looking at uh, more sites in, in Florida. I mean, we've been public about the Brownsville, Texas site. There's a really nice piece of property in Georgia that we're very interested in. Um, Puerto Rico has a really extraordinary uh, commercial launch site capability there at 18.6 uh, latitude, which is very favorable. Am I out of time? No, keep, oh, going. Okay. keep going. Um, very favorable for GTO flights. Um, and then I really would love to fly out of the south point of Hawaii. I think we get a lot of customers that want to come to those launches. So we got, we got a lot of work to do. And there will be no lack of SpaceX launch sites around the globe. So. Very good. Um, could you please expand on the stage one reentry capabilities? Yeah, so um, the, the plan is to have a nominal mission for anybody, a GTO mission, a low Earth orbit mission, have that first stage come back by doing a retro propulsion maneuver and come back and land just like you see Grasshopper land there. Um, 
that was one of the reasons for doing the 1.1 upgrade. Uh, it is more vehicle than is necessary to take any of our customers to their intended orbit. Um, and we're going to use that propellant to fly back. Back to the launch site. Back to the launch site. Okay. Well, not the launch pad, but the launch site. We're and actually looking at some property uh, on the Cape to bring, a, to bring a stage back. Surprisingly, range safety is really gung-ho. But they always have that button. <laughs> that that yes, button gives them lots of comfort. OK, it says, how will SpaceX select and train their astronauts? And the addendum is, how do I apply? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we'll be, we're just starting to work uh, the train, I shouldn't say just, we've been thinking about this for years. Um, we're just starting to put our plans together for the training program. Obviously, it has to be, you know, in lockstep with NASA's um, program initially, because I'm pretty sure the first flight, uh, crew flight, will have a combination of NASA astronauts and, and, and our kind of technicians, so to speak, uh, on board. Um, so it'll be, it, We'll be working with NASA initially, and then we'll see what makes sense. Um, we don't have a lot of experience with that uh, at this moment, um, and uh, we'll see what makes sense for purely commercial space, human space flight. Uh, a larger question. What, in your opinion, has changed in the last few years in terms of public awareness of space? I think there's no question that people are very, they're re-engaged in space um, due to the efforts probably of almost everybody in this room and folks that couldn't come. Um, I'm really excited. I've never seen more entrepreneurial uh, organizations spring up. Um, that's really the way this is going to work, right? It's going to be partnerships with the government. Um, no question, I don't think commercial can do it on their own. I think it's the partnership approach that's going to get us successfully to where we want to go. Um, but the commercial industry will weigh much more heavily. I mean, I, had, I did a little market survey uh, for, a, for an interview, uh, for an outlet. And uh, I mean, there were almost 100 new space uh, companies to talk about. It was really exciting. Very good. Uh, going back in your presentation, you talked about the first Falcon 1 launch and the things that happened there that caused it to be less than successful. Can you tell us what changes were instituted in the organizational culture, methods of communication that you learned and, and changed following that incident? So a uh, couple of things. The day we had that first, if someone said it more politically correct than I did, less than successful, I called it a failure. Um, <laughs> So uh, um, we did two, a couple things. We were AS9100 certified that day in the factory at Hawthorne. Or excuse me, it was in El Segundo at that time. So we, we knew that the development and the build approach was, was the right approach. Um, what we were not certified in was our activities at the launch site. So from then on, we included our launch and our test sites in all our uh, certifications for quality. Um, that was one thing. Uh, another thing is we looked very closely, much more closely at corrosion. Um, that vehicle was designed to fly out of Vandenberg um, in a much less corrosive environment. So we were caught off guard a little bit, but we were babies, you know. And uh, so, so a lot of kind of technical things we started thinking more heavily about. Um, and then certainly on the quality side, we started bringing in all sides. Okay, we're getting more questions, and I'm just trying to organize these in the proper order. Let's see, um, what is the business rationale for going to Mars? Yeah, so there is not a business case right now for Mars. <laughs> Let's be clearer. There is no business, Mars isn't gonna pay me. I mean, it, I'll get paid to take robotic spacecraft to Mars, um, but there is no business case on Mars. It's not, it's not really, well, it's not at all why we're doing this. Um, I, I don't, I can't think of another thing that would be as important as promoting humanity beyond one location. We're a single point failure, right? And there's no question that something dramatic is going to happen here on Earth. I'm not saying it's next week, not next year, probably not within the next hundred years, maybe not within the next thousand years. But I'm pretty sure something terrible is going to happen on Earth, and if this is the only place we have, then we're done. So 
Plus, how boring, you know, that this is it. I, I just can't believe that this is it. I don't think this is it. We got to go somewhere else. Super. Okay. Are you, back to the mundane, are you planning on allowing more secondary payloads during your testing and paid flights? And the, the questioner gives several examples, but I'll just leave it at that. Yes, when we stopped the Falcon 1 uh, product line, uh, we committed, we still committed to that community to fly. And, you know, I apologize, I don't have the numbers, but we've flown a lot of secondary satellites. On this most recent flight, Cassiope was the prime, but we flew CUSAT, Dandy, and Popax. Popax was three pack. Um, uh, and then I think we've got P pods on every flight going forward, um, and we're trying to come up with a standard way to fly uh, larger secondaries like CUSAT and, and Dandy. So yeah, we're still committed to that. Um, we've worked with a number of aggregators or integrators um, that could help us. Um, I'm pretty sure we'll be flying ESPA rings stuffed to the gills, actually, to get these folks flying. It's really important and it's part of our genetics. Is it part of your business case as well? No, you don't make any bit money on those. Okay. No. <laughs> okay, here's a, here's a very interesting question, and I'll just read it the way it was written. Do you think that the Falcon Heavy poses a threat to NASA's planned SLS? <laughs> I'm standing back. Yeah. You know, I, I'd rather talk, we have a great relationship with NASA, uh, most of NASA, um, and uh, I'd rather stick with the positive. We haven't flown Falcon Heavy yet. I think it will be a great vehicle. Uh, it will f just keep in mind this heavy vehicle is it's very different from the Delta IV heavy. This vehicle because we don't have an intermediate class launcher. The the current Falcon 9 is um, is really kind of a medium class EELV launch vehicle. So the intermediate class launches get taken up uh, by the heavy as well as the heavy missions on EELV get taken up by the heavy. So that we anticipate the heavy flying 10, 15 times a year. Um, so, from that perspective, it's very different from an SLS. It's currently smaller than an SLS. Um, well, actually, than what I knew the SLS to be. I, I'm not actually sure where it is right now, uh, performance-wise. Um, so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a competitor. I don't want to get into that argument. <laughs> okay. And it's I, perceived as one. <laughs> for the last question here, because we're about out of time, for your continued team growth, what uh, skill sets does SpaceX need the most? Most. It's hard to say. I mean, we've got probably 600 more people to hire in the next couple months. Um, software. You know, it's hard to convince hot software folks to, to leave the Bay Area and move to L.A. Apparently, it must be just a hellhole for these software guys. I don't know. Um, so we need software people, really hot software people. Um, guidance, navigation, and control folks. We need them. We need mechanical engineers, we need avionics folks. We really need everybody. Propulsion. Is that it? That's it. That's Thank it. you. Thanks Thank very you. much.